excellent. Um, well, yes, thank you. Thank you all for joining tonight. Again, for those that um, joined late um, or after I made this notice, the chat and the Q&A box is um, open. So please, um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to pop them in the, the chat and the Q&A box and we'll address them as we go along. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about um, all things the Australian federal budget. Jim Chalmers just delivered his second, I suppose, more or less official budget. The first budget was sort of, he called it the mini budget because they were just elected into government. So this was essentially um, Dr Chalmers' like first official large um, budget per se. So what we're going to be discussing tonight is obviously, um, well, first of all, the our beautiful disclaimer slide there, which, you know, this is for your entertainment purposes only. If you want to see how any of this impacts you on a personal level, um, please feel free to reach out to Jared or myself. We'll, we're happy to provide you personal financial advice. But everything in this, um, in this um, webinar is just for um, general information only. So what we're going to be touching on tonight or tonight is um, an introduction, you know, who am I, who is Jared? Um, then we're going to go through sort of the, the winners, the losers and the expats. We'll touch on um, a broader economic outlook uh, for Australia and where we see, I suppose, opportunities and what that uh, essentially the costs for the economic outlook for Australia. Um, impact and opportunities for both our resident clients and our expat clients. I can see that there's a couple of both of those on the on the webinar. So it's good, great to see you back. Um, and then again, the investment opportunities for 2023 and beyond. So for those new clients or new people joining our webinar, again, welcome. My name is Joel Kieran. I'm a senior financial advisor with Ally Wealth Management. Um, that is a, a photo of our beautiful office located in South Perth. And what Ally Wealth was created for was a to address the Australian um, and broader financial advice implications for either our domestic-based clients or our expat clients as well. So we provide a broad range of holistic advice services from wealth management, investment advice, superannuation, all kinds of planning. And um, yeah, we have clients, I look after clients probably in, I think it's a 31 different countries now. So we're um, still growing, still counting. And yeah, I'll throw it over to Jared and you can give yourself a little bit of a warm introduction as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Joel. Yes, evening, everyone. Great to see some familiar names uh, on the webinar this evening. Thank you very much for joining and also some new names as well. Uh, wonderful to meet you. Hopefully you get a lot of value out of tonight. Um, but yes, as, as Joel mentioned, I'm Jared Brown, uh, Senior Financial Planner with Global Financial Consultants. We're based in Singapore and we look after the Australian expat division of the firm. Um, oddly enough, the firm actually started in Sydney in 97 uh, and then found the, the majority of clients were expats, so shifted to Singapore in the early 2000s. Um, we, we'd like to think we do the Australian advice piece very well. Um, it is what we do on a day in, day out basis. Um, and obviously tonight we'll be having a look, uh, particularly how the budget impacts Aussie expats um, and those, I guess, planning to move home or even thinking about moving home in future. So lots to cover. Now, from a budget highlight standpoint, look, I, I must say this, this was really the most boring budget that, uh, well, gosh, I can certainly recall. Joel, I'm not sure about you. Uh, very little in it. Um, obviously, uh, part of our role, we do need to read it in great detail and explore how it does impact our clients. Um, there, there weren't really any surprises in terms of what was expected to be announced in the budget. Um, there were some quite interesting forecasts, which we will get into. But some of the headline numbers and some of the highlights, uh, yes, we are back in the black, um, as the Labor Party likes to announce. Dr. Sharma's delivered the first surplus in many years of uh, just over $4 billion. And that was basically all for two reasons. One being bracket creep, meaning that uh, GST and general tax revenues increased um, simply because people were earning a bit more money and naturally paying a greater amount of tax as a result. 
and the fact that we had iron ore forecast at $55 a tonne and coal uh, about 40% below where it was trading. So very poor forecasting, um, nothing terribly new or exciting on that front, but that was really what delivered a larger surplus than expected. Um, so nothing particularly clever, uh, nothing necessarily to be terribly proud of, and we will be back in the red next year. So let's move on from the fact that it was a surplus. It really is a bit of a meaningless announcement. Um, those, uh, those variables that I just outlined, the commodity price uh, forecast and the tax revenues delivered a $41 billion turnaround. Um, so that was what was uh, from the original forecasts. Um, we've got net debt at around 28%, um, which is up from about 23. Not terribly alarming at these levels, but uh, again, it, it is going to be a bit of an issue for future generations. Um, although given inflation is so high at the moment, it does enable the government to essentially inflate their way out of some of this debt um, that we do have to deal with. Uh, we do still have a bit of a cash deficit. And our nominal GDP growth outlook for the country over the next 12 months is 3%. Now, it's important to note this is the nominal GDP figure, which for anyone who hasn't done um, sort of high school, university level economics, this is before inflation. Now, as you probably have seen, our inflation figures are far too high. And that is why we are getting these rampant interest rate increases. So with a nominal GDP figure of 3% and inflation between six and seven, it means real GDP is in negative territory. So obviously the government um, and the RBA have a big incentive to bring those inflation figures down as quickly as is sensible. Um, and we'll get into a bit more of that as well. Um, look, in terms of budget winners, uh, again, there, there really was very little um, in this, we had the energy energy bill relief. Um, so there are three bill. Uh, sorry, the government is providing three billion to five million different households, essentially anyone receiving Centrelink payments, and that ranged uh, from one hundred and fifty odd dollars, one hundred and sixty five dollars, up to five hundred dollars and six hundred and fifty four businesses. Um, now, a lot of these support payments, the big I guess focus area was really on cost of living relief. Life is getting too expensive, interest rates are biting, and Australians are still spending far too much money at cafes and on travel. So it was always going to be a cost of living support budget. But what it has been badged as is disinflationary, meaning that the government is trying to convince the Australian public that by providing subsidies, such as this energy relief or relief subsidies, we should say, that it's not going to be inflationary. Now, that is complete garbage for anyone who understands how inflation works, because if I cut your bill by $500 or I give you $500, you will find somewhere else to spend that $500. It may not be a flat screen TV and it may not be all in one weekend, but that will still add pressure to inflation. So... Um, just to shed a bit of light, I guess, on what has been announced there. We've got some payments for single parents. Um, eligible child age has been increased to 14. Um, again, another $177 per fortnight. Given the cost of schooling, daycare, um, and the fact that wage growth for low to middle income earners really hasn't kept pace with inflation, this is not a huge amount of relief um, in dollar terms, but I guess better than nothing. Uh, we have seen huge announcements in terms of defence spending, as well as incentives for anyone who signs on to extend their term. And then we've got um, basically pennies on the dollar in terms of rental assistance. I think anybody who, tr who has tried to rent a property uh, anywhere in Australia over the last probably 12 to 18 months uh, would know that another $31 per fortnight really is not going to be life-changing. Um, it is still going to be very difficult and we have a massive housing shortage uh, right across the country. We then also do have um, some money being uh, contributed to those on Job Seeker, Odd Study, Youth Allowance um, with an additional $40 per fortnight. Again, not a major figure, um, not a major boost, but again, a bit better than nothing. Uh, Joel, I'll throw it to you if you like, if you'd like to uh, run us through some of the, the budget losers. Yeah, thanks. 
And I suppose back to, you know, just talking about some of the budget winners, I know that, you know, we've got some of our, um, you know, myself included and some of our clients that do live here in WA as well for the, for that sort of energy bill relief as well. Um, Mark McGowan has come out with the state budget, um, completely unrelated really to the federal budget. But again, we're getting about a 400, I think it's $400 credit off our, off our electricity bills as well. So again, this is probably more or less um, promoting that sort of spend as well, just within the state. And I suppose we'll wait and see what other um, states and territories will deliver as part of their um, budget plans as well. But for the federal budget losers, um, yeah, probably the big one is superannuation savers. Um, we're expecting the, or the, to introduce essentially a capped ceiling of $3 million um, on superannuation. So they want to increase the tax in which balances in excess of $3 million um, will be increased from 15 to 30%. Now, the way that this is sort of worded is can be a little bit interpreted either right or wrong. Again, additional clarity needs to come out um, from this, but it could, like the way it's worded is essentially taking your balance as at 1st of July one year, revaluing it um, at 30 June the following year. Is that, what is the difference in that balance? Um, is that in excess of $3 million? Then you could be penalised with additional tax. So this could be um, in some in some ways seen as a as a tax on wealth or unrealised gains as yet. So again, wait and see what what that actually looks like when it becomes legislation. But yeah, they're looking to definitely sharpen up their position regarding superannuation and essentially dictate the terms around what superannuation is used for. It is obviously they're trying to mandate that it is a retirement objective. And at the moment, if you've got more than $3 million inside your super fund, they see that as in, in surplus to need um, for a, a modest or healthy retirement objective in Australia. Smokers and vapors, the tobacco tax is once again going to be increased to by 5% over the next three years. So I'm pretty sure I read somewhere the other day that now cigarettes in Australia are one of the highest costs in the world. So we pay more um, for cigarettes than anywhere else in the world. So that's obviously again trying to disincentivate, um, dis disincentivize um, smoking, particularly in the country. Vaping as well, they're trying to ban the import of vapes into the country. Um, so again, probably transitioning um, vaping back to its original purposes for the purpose of people trying to quit um, traditional tobacco smoking. So we'll see um, additional taxes that get imposed on those and those sort of single use um, vapes, which you know the younger generation seem to have um, adapted uh, quite highly and quite favourably, um, they're looking to clamp down on that and essentially outrule it. Um, first home buyers, again, no additional places, no meaningful plans for more affordable housing. It's pretty much a, a big nothing for um, home buyers. There's not really a great deal to talk about. Um, and for the expats on the call as well, no updates to our tax residency rules either. This is still a very much a grey area in trying to, to clarify when and where you would be deemed a tax resident of Australia. Um, I know that there was rules that came, um, came out or they wanted to change the, the tests in when you would be classified. Again, this was a very grey and open to a lot of interpretation. So, um, yeah, no update on that. You know, we've got plenty of other um, web, uh, essentially webinars and material on that. So if you need to know more ins and outs of the tax residency rules, feel free to reach out. Scammers, um, $58 million funding for a national anti-scam centre and $10.9 million for SMS, SMS identify register. So this is just essentially some funding going in um, to prevent people being scammed in the country. I don't think largely it will make a great deal of difference to stop people being scammed out of um, financial loss. Um, just essentially creating a register to hold that information to say I was scammed and this was the how I got scammed. Um, and multinationals, again, 
large foreign companies to have a minimum tax of 15% imposed. So you were going to see um, that sort of tax avoidance, you know, I'm sure depending on what paper you read, um, you always see these headlines where large multinational pays zero tax in Australia with billions of dollars of revenue. Um, that sort of clamp or that's going to be essentially tightened up a little bit so they pay at least a minimum amount of tax. So that could essentially hit the, the bottom line of some of their balance sheets, particularly where historically they've paid no tax. Um, so they're going to have to start potentially paying some fair share of tax. But again, mirroring what Jared was saying, the, the budget itself was relatively boring. And we also um, saw that particularly with Peter, um, sorry, Dutton's reply reply um, budget. And he said, under a coalition government, I lead, your taxes will be lower. Taxation is the killer of aspiration. Labor recklessly spends, carelessly cuts, and inadequately saves. Um, so yeah, this was a very interesting um, point, given that the coalition government in its last term was the highest taxing government in Australian history. So again, we're, uh, very interesting to see what the Liberal Party actually proposed. They had no proposed um, reply per se. They just said that Labor sucks um, in a pretty much a nutshell <laughs> and without any, I suppose, real um, solution of how they prepare to fix it or what they would do differently. Oh, the economic outlook for Australia, um, again, um, there's plenty of going on, particularly with the numbers over Australia, and it's going to be a very interesting couple of years coming forward, particularly, um, again, GDP growth forecast um, sitting at about 1.5%. Um, in Sorry, in the next financial year, the following year, 2.75. So these are the numbers that are built into the budget and their, and their forecasts. Again, probably well, time will tell really. They're sort of, again, crystal balling what that forecast looks like. You know, we've got a sort of back in black surplus um, at the moment because of um, forecasts that were not accurate in um, prior budgets. So again, time will tell what that looks like. The cash rate forecast, again, sitting at about 3%. So depending on, I suppose, that's currently slightly higher than, um, or sorry, slightly lower than where we currently are now. So it just depends on what um, impact this sort of um, cash rate in, increase environment is going to have on spending and um, stimulus throughout the economy. I would like to hope that, you know, we're sort of seeing, you know, now that fixed rate mortgage holders are starting to have that sort of cliff. Lots of my clients, you know, myself included, um, have had beautiful fixed rates starting with a one, come to an end, and now they're starting at sort of five and a half. That's having a bit of um, a tightening of some purse strings, particularly in households around the country. That will continue to carry forward, particularly over the next 12, 24 months as the remainder of those relatively low fixed rates actually do come to a conclusion. Um, we anticipate the unemployment um, rate will increase. So that unfortunately means that um, the about probably 200, 300,000 people will yet to lose their jobs, um, particularly over the next two to three years, um, which in Australians terminology as well, we consider full employment sitting at about that high fours to 5%. So unemployment at the moment in the, in the medium to high threes. Again, we're, we're very much, you know, if you're trying to look for staff or you're working for a business looking for staff, that can be quite tough. Largely, again, we're going to see net overseas migration come in. So we've basically opened up the borders. There's a plan for the remainder of 2023 to 400,000 um, new visa holders to bring in that sort of skilled, that skilled labour into the country to fill those, um, to fill that shortfall in, in that workforce. So the temporary visa changes um, largely will be surroundings, I suppose, students, um, working holiday makers and temporary skilled workers. Um, so the Department of Foreign Affairs really wants to, I suppose, open that back up, um, can 
in whereas previously we've had a significant shortfall in the prior years. So you can see that that um, essentially borders open. That last graph there, March 2023, we're starting to see influx. And with a particular priority is going around um, that skilled that skilled workforce, particularly coming in. I know in WA alone and around the country, basically, if you if you're a healthcare worker, teacher, nurse, anything that can um, that can be very fundamental to the core of our economy, you're basically guaranteed a job and a visa into the country. Household savings, again, we're starting to see that trickle down. So this is um, in difference to what, like compared to the pandemic, obviously when we were all sort of locked up at home, um, our cash savings largely grew. Uh, across across the board, we're starting to see that trickle down as um, the borders have opened up. Lots of holidays are being spent. Australians are spending lots of money still on shopping, um, holidays, dining out. So this is um, again eating into that sort of cash savings buffer. And what we're going to probably see go forward again, if you hold a mortgage that will also start to um, deteriorate that um, buffer as well as interest rates increase and consumption growth as well. So what we're seeing there is consumption growth uh, slow down slightly as well. So with um, increased in rates, increased in um, inflation, cost of things goes up, you don't buy as much, just things cost more. Business confidence, again, largely still quite confident. So you see there um, in the chart on the right, the business conditions and confidence, you know, if we date back to the pre-pandemic, you see that large dip. And what that has meant is you had a very contraction in our economy. That has significantly rebounded, obviously in early parts of March, or sort of 2021, 2022, that's now started to soften with, um, with monetary policy starting to dictate the terms of borrowing. So before we could essentially borrow money for, for jam, and now the cost of borrowing money and expanding businesses, again, that's going to take a little bit more cost to, to do so. So your business confidence slows slightly. Mining and non-binding mining business investments, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, these continue to grow as well. So. If you've got, if what we're sort of looking at is if these companies have strong balance sheets, strong cash in their economy, or strong cash on their balance sheets, they will continue to um, expand that. The the small, the the tech, so or sorry, any sort of small business that requires lending is going to have contraction just by means of additional costs. Exports um, going out of the country again. Mining is still going to be, has very much dictated that largely. The, the need for iron ore and demand, particularly out of China, is still remaining quite strong, which has obviously helped forecast this budget through into the black. Carrying forward a very strong iron ore price into 2023 is still is obviously what's padded out the government balance sheet. So you can see nominal to GDP growth um, slowing slightly as well just from imports and exports as um, the Australian dollar particularly softens, that makes our um, goods attractive to export, um, not so good to import goods into the country. Opportunities for our resident clients. So Australian residents, the first, the first what we're seeing here is our stage three tax cuts. This comes into effect from the 1st of July 2024. So you can see there that this what this is sort of what it looks like from a, a difference perspective, um, depending on your income. So just take a sort of relatively median income there of $100,000. Um, you're looking at about a tax difference of about $1,375 per annum. It's really also important to highlight as well the Low to medium, low to middle income tax offset is also being removed this financial year. So, last year it was extended as part of the pandemic under the prior um, treasurer Josh Frydenberg. This that is now going to be ending. So, where previously you would have received a tax offset of up to fifteen hundred dollars, that's no longer going to be the case. So, in a way, 
you this financial year, again, no tax offset, no tax um, cut this year. So we will eventually, we will be paying more tax essentially this financial year. And then next year, when should these tax cuts proceed, um, we'll be getting a little bit of that essentially back again. But at the top end of town, if you're earning $200,000, you are going to get uh, a tax benefit of $9,000. It is important to realise that for the tax cuts as well, we do we will probably have another election before this becomes um, before this becomes legislated into law. So um, we'll see if I suppose next year, this time next year, if the government decide to change anything. Australian residents, again, energy relief payments. So each, again, back to this, each state is different. ACT, $175 for eligible households. New South Wales is giving that up to $500. WA is giving um, up to $400 or $400 or $500. Um, and there's additional payments if you're on Centrelink payments. Um, and then main criteria, again, if you're on Centrelink payments, um, sorry, I've just, just, <laughs> I've just gotten lost about the state budget um, uh, energy relief compared to the federal. So let's talk about the federal budget ones. So yeah, $500 energy relief payments um, will be going through to those households that are on Centrelink and small businesses will get an additional boost up to $650. There might be additional state budget um, energy relief that comes through that will be in addition to this. Um, ACT obviously is different, um, which is capped up to those. No changes to the stage three tax cuts announced, superannuation balances, we've um, touched on that earlier. Um, so from a superannuation cap of $3 million, what it doesn't take into account, unfortunately, is um, indexing or inflationary, um, I suppose, purposes. So they've basically set the $3 million um, cap at today's value. Obviously, if you're 30 years old and inflation continues to run at 4%, if by the time you get to age 65, that the value of $3 million in today's value is actually only worth 760000 So I would like to see additional um, work be put largely into this superannuation um, cap of $3 million. I think it needs to be have a little bit more tweaking done to it just to make sure that we're not disincentivizing strong investment into superannuation. Superannuation largely remains our most tax effective retirement vehicle in this country. Um, so, and largely I can't foresee that the Australian government want to disincentivize it um, too much and have everyone on an age pension. So again, it's probably very also very important to consider saving for the purpose of retirement um, because at and under present rules and legislation, uh, superannuation pension payments are tax-free um, when you hit retirement income phase. So again, very, very attractive, sexy retirement vehicle. Australian businesses, uh, the small asset write-off, that seems to be, um, that has been reduced significantly down from about, you know, 150 or 200,000 in some cases. You know, we had previous years where, um, you know, I think it was Scott Morrison saying tradies can go out and buy a ute and claim the instant asset write-off. That's obviously going to be a little bit harder when the, in, when the write-off is only up to $20,000. Not many utes in this country or the um, used car market for that matter, you're gonna find anything particularly valuable for $20,000. But again, anything, any um, turnover under $10 million can still take advantage of that instant asset write-off and up to $20,000. Energy efficiency. So investments in energy um, efficient equipment and um, facilities allows for a further $20,000 tax deduction. Again, if you're looking to upgrade your business to make it um, perhaps more energy efficient, um, that could be retiring old um, energy consuming equipment um, to more efficient uh, efficient equipment per se, then you can claim an additional $20,000 tax deduction on that upgrade. Utility support, again, businesses with turnover up to 50 million will also receive $650 off their electricity bill. The build to rent tax, 
Um, so that has been flashed. Capital works tax, de tax deduction rate will increase from 2.5% to 4%. That's the depreciation that you can claim on um, the build. To rent, this applies for properties commenced after the 9th of May 2023. Again, withholding rate, um, withholding tax rate will be also be reduced from 30% down to 15 on managed investment trusts. And the for, this is forecasted to cost the government um, $30 million. Again, this is largely part of uh, the, the tax cuts which had flown through. Um, the eligibility criteria, the build to rent uh, projects of 50 or more apartments. They must rent to the general public and they must be held under single ownership for at least 10 years and lease terms of at least three years. So what this is essentially trying to do is trying to get um, the uh, essentially the idea that renting long term is not necessarily a terrible thing. And we're trying to incentivize that new build and um, making sure that you know, this rent crisis per se is not going to get any worse. Um, so we're trying to incentivize that um, less tax on the rent to build, or sorry, build to rent schemes and get more people in um, affordable housing. What's missing from the budget largely for our Aussies? Well, there's a lot missing in my opinion, but we're, you know, that's largely opinion related, more or less than, um, than economics related. But again, any sort of meaningful um, plans towards renewable energies, that is, you know, yet to be seen. No changes to the GST. The government, obviously, depending on what side of politics you decide to play on, you know, the GST has largely remained at 10% since essentially its inception. Um, negative gearing, CGT relief on um, principal place of residence, there's been no changes of that. Um, I think particularly with property at the moment, you know, you would make a pretty unfavorable government for taxing or um, applying capital gains tax to your primary residence or um, changes to negative gearing, particularly when we've got housing, housing issues. No childcare reforms and um, no sort of real incentives for investment in a lot of places. It's just, again, a pretty much a big old boring budget. Um, Jared, anything else that I, you consider that I've missed? <coughs> Otherwise, I'll throw over to you for um, where you can take us through the opportunities for our expat clients. Yeah, certainly, Joel. No, look, I think that um, that really sums it up nicely. I think the superannuation uh, caps of $3 million probably really haven't received enough attention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of our clients are sort of in their 30s and 40s starting or continuing their expat journey. And unless we see indexation introduced or, uh, I mean, let's face it, there will be many changes of government before uh, a 30-year-old is reaching retirement. Um, mm -hmm. But it certainly leads to, um, to a big need for a lot more planning. Um, as far as what role superannuation is going to play, because seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, yeah, if you want to be living a truly comfortable life in retirement, is not going to last a terribly long time. Mm -hmm. So certainly, lots uh, lots of work to be done. And and to your point earlier, hopefully, common sense prevails there, and we see a little bit a little bit more of a rework. Yeah, um, sure. We will uh, we will watch and wait. Um, a four-hour expats, gosh, I mean, I think this might be the shortest update in history because there really just was nothing uh, for our expat clients in the budget. So a couple of things, I guess, to um, reiterate more than uh, was announced in the budget. So a couple of things that were missing. Tax residency, uh, we have really already covered. There was nothing there. Uh, yes, it is very frustrating that they cannot bring themselves to update policy that was first introduced in 1936. Uh, it is ridiculous, I guess, in, uh, in some ways. It's been 90 odd years, so why rush? Uh, but hopefully we will get a bit of an update on this one in the near future. All things going to plan and based on what we do know now, it is not going to have any real impact on those Australians living in a country with a double tax agreement. Um, so for myself in Singapore, uh, for a lot of Australians in countries with a double tax agreement with Australia, there really will be no change. Uh, but it is those that are sitting in countries like uh, Dubai, most of the Middle East, Hong Kong, for example, 
where there is no double tax agreement, then it could present some real challenges and some real opportunities for planning. So to Joel's point, we, will, we already have quite a number of webinars. We will have more as soon as there is something else to talk about on that front. Um, and then we'll be able to put some real case studies and real scenarios together around what people need to be doing. Um, the other big one, the concessional super contributions. Again, there was no change here. But why this is particularly important and why, why I include it um, is obviously for expat, we don't get the main residence exemption if we sell property in Australia. Even if we lived in that for a number of years, if you sell that property as an expat whilst you're offshore, you pay tax from the purchase price. It is harsh, it is draconian, but it is what it is. Now, one of the tools we have at our disposal to, uh, to offset some of that taxable gain is with a carry forward concessional contribution. Now, this means that if you've been offshore for a little while, you can carry forward up to five years worth of super contributions. So that could be $125,000, $130,000 each. So if you're a couple, you own a property together, that could be $250,000, $260,000 that you can contribute to your super and offset against that uh, taxable gain on your property. Uh, so certainly one to keep uh, in the back pocket, even if you're planning to go back, uh, again, another good way to uh, get that effective tax rate a little closer uh, to what we're used to in Singapore. Certainly not all the way, um, but a little closer nonetheless. Um, what is missing? I mean, gosh, well, there really was nothing there. So where do we start? No update on tax residency, no update on the main residence. Um, so that's really it on the expat side. Um, Joel, I guess we might uh, round out with a bit of an update on the investment opportunities. Thanks, Joe. Very short. I feel like usually sometimes you get to pat out the, the webinar, but <laughs> not this time. I get to do all the talking. I tried. Uh, I tried. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the... With the investment opportunities we've got going forward, again, volatility brings brings across some opportunity and it's just about um, feeding through the market and finding out um, where, where we see these opportunities. And there is still plenty of quality in the market, particularly for um, some investment opportunities here. For example, we take, you know, we've probably all read um, Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, UBS, this, you know, has been quite topical in um, the finance markets, you know, this year already. Um, what this has essentially done is it's caused a bit of a soften in the indexes of the diversified banks worldwide. And it's, um, again, with that consumer confidence, just sort of softening slightly. It's really important to realise as well the likelihood of the sort of SVB um, Playing, playing out, particularly in Australia, is very unlikely. Australia has very strict um, capital requirements of our banks to essentially reinforce and underpin the banks as a, a more or less a structural pillar of the economy. So the last thing that um, essentially the Australian government want is for the um, Australian banks to face liquidity or financial issues. So it's very unlikely that that's going to happen. But this just sort of highlights that, is this going to be likely forever? Well, nothing is usually likely forever. So there is opportunity there, um, you know, to get in and find the where there is definitely value, particularly in that financial sectors. Um, cash rates, or the sort of other market opportunities we see is, again, cash rates sort of reaching their peak. So we're sort of seeing the um, central banks around the world starting to see the impact that the rate rising cycle has, has played throughout the various economies. So we're starting to see, um, in, essential, in, a sense, in essence, more um, thought, more breaks being applied to potential further increases. There's lots more thought and um, methodologies going in behind either increasing rates um, holding or um, potentially decreasing rates. We're also seeing obviously the fixed income and bond returns stabilizing, which is obviously very welcome news, um, particularly over the last sort of six, 12 months. We had a very um, up and down sort of cycle in our markets where we saw 
in essence, negative returns on our equity markets and negative um, returns on our bonds. So we're starting to see both of them starting to correlate and realign again. So that can bring around, obviously, picking the quality end of the market um, in both your stocks and your um, and in your bonds. You like there is definitely opportunities there for that sort of long term growth. Um, volatility in the shares market that will continue as I as I foresee probably for another couple of months. This is just again riding out to the absolute end of our rate rising cycle. So again, opportunities there largely for long term money. I usually say to my clients here that we don't want to be investing um, any sort of money that we can turn around and make a quick buck in sort of a relatively short amount of time. We're going to be carrying very high risk with that um, potentially sort of a one in three um, percent or sort of one in three chance of a negative return at any time in the short term. Um, and then, yeah, interest rates um, starting to bite. So that is potentially putting um, not exacerbated, um, you know, uh, craziness on sort of our house prices previously where, you know, you could get a mortgage at, you know, one and a half percent or two percent, you know, it was quite cheap to borrow additional funds to secure certain properties. That's not so much the case anymore. So again, across the market, there's a very broad range of um, assets, uh, largely for that long-term wealth creation. And yeah, it's just more or less getting the right, getting the right advice Pick, making sure you're picking the right investments um, that serve that purpose. Um, largely, we want to focus on the quality end of the market, companies with good balance sheets, um, not carrying great deals of debt um, to carry us through, particularly through um, this sort of normalised um, inflationary environment. Hopefully inflation comes down a little bit and then we can um, sort of get back to, again, a more normal pace. I suppose time will tell. That largely concludes the market opportunities that I have um, to talk about and largely concludes our webinar. We've rushed through this in a quality 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, please, and please feel free to pop them in the chat. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to um, reach out to Jared or myself personally and we can have a meeting, go through anything in more depth um, and consider how this personally impacts um, you on a financial or personal level. This will also be up on our social media. So I do encourage you all to like, subscribe and follow us on social media. We do post um, quite actively on our socials. So it's good to it's good to get some feedback as well and to see what people are following, seeing what people like to see. Any any feedbacks or recommendations? You know, we'd love to hear it. How's the chat box going, Jared? I think everyone is full bottle on the budget, to be honest. Uh, not seeing a yep. lot of questions come through. No. Wasn't expecting no. a great deal, to be perfectly no. honest. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, look, thank you. I, I'll give you back 15 minutes of your evening or uh, morning, depending on where you are in the world. But thanks so much for tuning in and um, we look forward to speaking to you all again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, everyone.